Hello, in video six of the evolution unit, we are going to talk about how evolution can lead to the formation of new species. So first, um, we have to, to understand how new species forms, we first have to define species. So we're going to define species as a group of individuals whose members can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So the most important part here is that your species, if you could breed with other members of your species, and if that breeding produces fertile offspring. Um, so oftentimes, um, people try to think of species as organisms who look like one another, um, but that's not always necessarily the case. So for example, all of these spiders here all look very different, yet because they can all interbreed and all can have fertile offspring, they're considered to be the same species. Um, just so you know, these are all members of the happy face, spi uh, happy face spiders, which are called this, if, if you look at their backs, they all look like they're smiling. They all have um, happy faces on their backs. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story, and this story is going to be an example of how new species can form. So um, speciation, we're going to define as the emergence of new species, and this story is going to be an example of speciation. So this is going to be a, an example of speciation by methods of what we call geographic isolation, and we'll get to that later in the video. But for now, let's set the scene. So the scene is I have some fruit flies, and they're, you know, doing their fruit fly thing and laying some eggs on a banana. And then, bam, disaster strikes. And a hurricane washes the banana to an island off the coast of the mainland. So in other words, the banana with the fruit flies are removed to a distant location. So now I have two populations. I have a population of fruit flies hanging out on the island that they were washed to by the hurricane, and a population hanging out on the mainland. So now what happens next is over thousands of years or hundreds of years, these populations diverge. So I get things like natural selection, genetic drift, mutations, um, no gene flow because the flies can't get between the island and the mainland. In other words, the two populations of flies become more or more different. So eventually, those flies do meet again for some reason, but now the populations can't mate anymore and they can't have fertile offspring because they developed so many differences due to natural selection, um, genetic drift, etc. Um, so they have differences in behavior, differences in anatomy, food preference, mating time, and because they no longer mate, they're no longer the same species. Okay. So speciation basically occurs when you're not getting gene flow, when there's reduced gene flow between two populations. Um, so in other words, two populations aren't mixing, they're becoming more and more different because they're responding to different environmental um, selection factors via evolution, um, and they're becoming more and more different. And these differences cause reproduction barriers, things that prevent them from reproducing. Um, so reproductive barriers are just a byproduct of the way different populations of um, adapt differently to different environments. So the, the most of this video is going to be us talking about different reproductive barriers, different things that can make two different populations no longer to be able to mate anymore. So reproductive barriers um, fall into two main categories. There are what we call prezygotic barriers. Remember, zygotic kind of sounds like zygote. Remember, that's the formation of an egg and a sperm coming together. So basically, prezygotic barriers are barriers that prevent the zygote from forming. They prevent fertilization or mating. And postzygotic barriers means that it's something that the zygote's able to form, but that zygote does not develop into an offspring. So this would be um, would be preventing the formation of fertile offspring usually. Okay, so this is just a list of the different barriers we're going to look at. The prezygotic barriers we're going to look like are listed here, and the postzygotic barriers we're going to look at are listed here. So you could use this as a little summary slide um, when you're studying. Um, so I really like this graphic because it shows you how prezygotic barriers are things that basically prevent the zygote from forming. So these are um, differences that make it so basically two individuals can no longer mate. They cannot form a viable zygote. And then postzygotic barriers are things that allow the zygote to form but prevent the formation of viable fertile offspring. Remember the definition of a species was that you can mate and form viable fertile offspring. So any of these things listed here could prevent that from happening. So let's talk about prezygotic barriers first.
So the first prezygotic barrier would be habitat isolation. So this is basically like, I have two species, and they live in the same general area, but not in the same kinds of places. So because they're not living in the same kind of area, they're never going to mate and never have fertile offspring. Um, so therefore, they're considered to be two different species. So for example, um, there are garter snakes that live in western North America, but one lives in the water and one lives on the land. So because they have different habitat preferences, they're not going to mate and therefore are considered to be different species. And remember, it was natural selection that led to the preferences of these two species. A different, a second prezygotic barrier would be temporal isolation. So this might be if one population had a mutation that made them um, want to breed at one time of the year, and a different population had a mutation that made them want to breed at a different time of the year, um, they're never going to reproduce and have fertile offspring. So this would be when two species breed at different times, different seasons, or different times of day. So an example would be there are two tr species of trees in Central California. Um, the bishop pine produces pollen, which remember is tree sperm, during April, but the Monterey pine produces pollen during February. So because natural selection made these two different trees pollinate at different times of the year, they're never going to reproduce and have fertile offspring together because they, um, they undergo reproduction at different times of the year. So this is an example of temporal isolation leading to speciation. Um, one of my favorite um, types of prezygotic uh, barriers is behavioral isolation. This would be when a population um, had a mutation that gave them a different behavior. And because they have a different behavior, um, a different population no longer would want to mate with them, so they would have a different, they, they would be a different species. So maybe they have a mating song or a mating dance or different mating plumage, that's like feathers and birds. And um, if they have the wrong song or dance, they're not going to be able to mate with different populations and therefore are considered to be different species. And there's a really famous example of this, of the birds of paradise, which are all these different birds that do all these different crazy dances, and because they don't do the same dances, they don't mate with one another and are considered to be different species. Um, the next prezygonic barrier is mechanical isolation. And basically this is that um, because different populations are put together differently anatomically, like their, their bodies are built different ways due to a different types of um, adaptations they have due to natural selections, the male and female sex organ are no longer compatible. So this might be, an um, example would be if you had two snail populations, and if one snail population had a spiral that spun in a left-handed direction, like if it spun, um, I think it's clockwise, and you had a different snail that there's shells spun counterclockwise, they are not able to successfully mate. So this mutation would mean that these would be two different species because they're no longer able to reproduce and have fertile offspring. Another example in plants might be if you, they have different flower structures that attract different pollinators. Um, if those pollinators are only going to go to certain flowers and, and they're not going to transfer pollen between other flowers and, the, and those flowers, um, those plants are not going to reproduce and have offspring. So therefore, those plants are different um, species as well. So here, there's a picture here looking at the snail spiral. So you can see if there are two snails where their shells are both spiraling in the same direction. So you can see this one's spiraling clockwise and this one's spiraling clockwise. They're able to mate successfully. But you can see maybe this snail is from a different population, so its uh, sh shell spirals counterclockwise, and this one goes clockwise. And you can see they cannot mate successfully. And the last prezygotic barrier, the last barrier that, that would prevent the formation of a zygote, um, would be gametic isolation. And this is basically when the egg and the sperm are physically not able to combine because they are not compatible. Um, so, for example, the egg and sperm of the red and purple sea urchins cannot fuse to form a zygote because proteins on the surface of the egg and sperm cannot bind to one another. So, in other words, maybe the red sea urchin had a mutation that put different proteins on the surface of their egg and sperm. So, therefore, the egg of the red um, sea urchin could not no longer combine with the sperm of a purple sea urchin. So therefore, the red and purple sea urchins are considered to be different species because their um, gametes cannot combine. So those were all barriers that prevented the formation of a zygote. However, sometimes um, 
individuals are able to mate successfully, but their offspring are not viable or are not fertile. So there are many, these are, these are considered to be post-zygotic barriers, and we're going to walk through a couple examples of these. Um, so the first one is hybrid inviability, and this is basically when the offspring does not ever turn into, like the zygote never fully forms into an offspring. So the offspring fails to survive to maturity. So for example, if you mated a sheep and a goat together, which is two different species, the zygote would form, but that, that, that baby would never be born. That zygote would die very early in development. So that's an example of hybrid inviability. We can also have hybrid infertility or sterility, which means that you're getting an offspring, but the offspring is not fertile. The offspring itself cannot have any offspring. So for example, you can cross a horse and a donkey, which is two completely different species, and you get what's called the mule, but that mule is sterile. That mule cannot have any offspring. So therefore, the mule is not um, fertile, so therefore it's, the horse and donkey are considered to be different species. Similarly, you could also cross a male lion and a female tiger and get ligers, or you could cross a female lion and a male tiger and get tigons, but in both cases here, that hybrid animal, the liger or the tigon, is sterile, so therefore lions and tigers are considered to be different species. So here you can see a picture of a mule, what you get when you cross a horse and a donkey. And here, I don't know if this is a liger or a tigon, but what, it's what you get when you cross a lion and a tiger. And, you know, this is actually a really sad case because these ligons and tigers, um, not only are they, they sterile, but they also have a lot of um, developmental disabilities. And because they're um, basically, they're the equivalent of a... Um, human with Down syndrome because they have the wrong number of chromosomes um, from crossing a lion and a tiger together. Okay. And the last example of post-zygotic barriers that we're going to talk about is hybrid breakdown. And this is basically when the first generation of offspring, the first generation of hybrids, are pretty viable and pretty fertile, but the offspring of those offspring are very feeble or sterile. So basically, after a couple of generations, you start to get sterile individuals. And this happens a lot when you cross different species of cotton. The first set of offspring are pretty good, but after that, um, they break down pretty quickly. So therefore, those species of cotton are con considered to be different species. Okay. So those are all those barriers we talked about are all um, ways that can, things that can lead to speciation. Um, but the last thing I want to point out is that just having one of those barriers alone does not necessarily cause speciation. You you have to, they have to lead to um, either no reproduction, no interbreeding, or no fertile offspring. So for example, if you have geographic isolation, if you have two species that are geographically isolated from one another, it will only lead to speciation if the, the two populations don't interbreed and don't have fertile offspring. Because you think about it, I could isolate two beetle populations, but they still might be able to um, overcome that isolation and either, you know, walk between populations or if they were birds, fly between populations. Um, so you have to get both the barrier and the actual preventing of mating as well. So that's video six. See you in video seven.